Well, good morning. Isn't communication a funny thing? <laughs> um, so this morning we're going to start with our call to worship, which is from Psalm 89. So if you would please stand as I read from the NIV. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, and that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Please join us in singing. seated. As we move into, before we move into a time of prayer, I wanted to use this time to make two or three announcements. First of all, you already knew when I started December 1st that this would be my last Sunday. You have me through today, and I've been so grateful to 
have had this opportunity and to come to have known you as a congregation, and um, it's, it's something that I'll always remember. Joyce is not with us today because she has surgery in the morning in Indianapolis, and she's had, having to quarantine. Uh, she had a COVID test as a matter of course on Friday, and she has to quarantine for 96 hours before surgery tomorrow. Uh, which means I'm going to distance myself a little bit from you after this service because I'm driving her to Indianapolis tomorrow morning bright and early. So, you know, I don't want to be German-fested driving her when she's quarantined. So I'm not being cold. I'm just trying to keep a distance from you. I'm sorry that it has to be that way on my last Sunday here that I can't bump fists or hug or shake hands or something. But I'm just going to try to keep my distance so I keep her healthy for surgery tomorrow. Sec uh, other announcements that need to be made today, we have some impending departures. Other than myself, John and Debbie Stidham are going to Washington Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church where John will begin his duties as pastor tomorrow. And as nothing like stepping from one to the other, uh, having been a district superintendent, having been in search of qualified pastors to serve part-time congregations. I know how hard it is to find really gifted people, and John and Debbie will be blessings to this congregation. They, John is a very, as you know, very tender and learned man. He's going to be a wonderful pastor for that congregation. And again, as a district superintendent former, I know how hard it is to find people to fit into part-time churches, and I thank you so much for being available. Debbie's uh, father, Mr. Taylor, Reverend Taylor, served his last congregation, what, 48 years? <laughs> I took him, you know, when I took him out, I said, how are you going to follow this guy? <laughs> he, was, he was my social studies teacher when I was in high school. Um, and then Jennifer Harris will be leaving us. Jennifer is going to be here through July 7th. But rather than, um, than uh, speak from the cuff, I, I wrote something out I want to say about Jennifer. Um, Jennifer has exceptional gifts for ministry. I mean truly exceptional gifts for ministry. I've worked with, and I've, I've worked with gifted musical staff at Bloomington First United Methodist Church from the School of Music at Indiana University. Jennifer is a very gifted worship and music minister. So she has extraordinary gifts for ministry. She's been committed to this church, to this particular church, in very unusual and difficult times. She's invested in the Vincennes community, buying a home, fixing it up, working for the university. Um, she's decided that her best direction forward is to pursue some possibilities that are becoming apparent to her in Florida. I'm going to add, from my perspective, she deserves credit and praise for keeping this ship moving steadily forward in turbulent waters. The strength of this congregation is in no small measure related to the leadership she's provided you in the last year. So, again, Jennifer, we'll see you next Sunday. I won't see you next Sunday, but the congregation will see you next Sunday. Um, I'd like for us now to go to God in a time of prayer. Loving God, we, we know that you are always with us, and we don't have to invite your presence into our lives. We know that you are the God of all creation, that the rain falls and the sun rises on the just and the unjust, that you love all of creation. We know that you are especially with us when we pass through the deep and dark valleys of life. 
And this morning we ask that you be with Michelle Dellinger as she mourns the death of her sister Kayla Nimmers. We ask that you be with the Dellinger family and the extended family in this time of deep sorrow. Give them safe passage when they return to Vincennes. Remind them that you are with them every moment of every day. God, we ask that you be with those, whoever they are, who are hospitalized or feeling fearful and alone today. I ask that you be with my wife, Joyce, as she prepares for surgery to again repair a shoulder that's caused her tremendous pain and immobility for over a year now. So guide the surgeon's hands tomorrow and bring healing to her. I ask that you be with Cheryl and Darren Williams as they prepare to transition to ministry here in Vincennes. That you bring them safely here. That you gift him with your touch as he prepares to assume this new post. God, be with our country. Be with our country as we navigate treacherous waters and remind us that finally we are the United States of America, not red states and not blue states, but the United States of America. Remind us that together we are strong. We love you, God. Every day we become increasingly aware of our personal need and our corporate need for you. Be with us in this hour as we gather to praise your name. Amen. And now I invite us to do the offering. Again, we're not going to pass the plate. We're going to invite you to go to the rear of the sanctuary and deposit your tithe and your offering. Or if you haven't, or perhaps you've already done it or you choose to do it after the service. But we won't be passing the plate. And I want to thank you again, those of you who have gone online to continue to support the church in a systematic way. That's so important. Uh, part of my sermon today is going to be about how vital the witness of the church is in these times. And the church continues to be able to provide a vital witness through your generosity. So let us now receive our tithes and our offerings.
Our scripture this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another who came up, he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. God blesses always the reading from the Holy Bible. Let us pray. God, may the words from my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Those words have always been considered to be the hinge, the pivotal spot in Luke's gospel as he tells the story about Jesus' ministry. From beginning to chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus has been in Galilee, mostly in Galilee. But beginning with verse 51, he turns his face to go to Jerusalem. And from chapter 9, verse 51, to chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to meet his destiny. Chapter 19, verse 28, he enters Jerusalem on the day that we call Palm Sunday. So this is the pivotal verse in Luke's gospel about Jesus' life and Jesus' ministry. Up to this point, he's been in Galilee. From this point forward, he's headed to Jerusalem to meet his destiny. Now, there are many ways that any verse of Scripture can be applied to our daily lives. It seems to me that one way we could apply this Scripture to our daily lives is that it tells us we must meet rejection with grace. Because isn't Jesus rejected here again? He is coming to a Samaritan village. And they refuse to accept him. And James and John want retribution, don't they? James and John want to, draw, to take a page from Elisha's book and bring fire down to consume the village. So they say to Jesus, Lord, will you have us bring fire down and destroy this village? For rejecting you? Jesus says, chill. We're going on down the road to another village. We have to learn to accept rejection because life is filled with rejection. Jesus is rejected from the very beginning of his ministry, remember? He comes 
to the Jordan River and is baptized by John the Baptist. He goes immediately from his baptism into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to figure out God's claim on his life because the heavens have opened while he's being baptized and the spirit in the form of a dove lands on him. We read about that in Luke 3. He comes up out of the waters of the Jordan River. He goes immediately into the wilderness where he stays 40 days and 40 nights to try to figure out what God's claim on his life is. And what does he do when he comes out of the wilderness? He goes immediately to his hometown. He goes to, to Nazareth and he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth. And he reads from Isaiah chapter 58. And then he says... In your presence, this scripture has been realized. And what do his hometown folks say? Are they proud that the hometown boys come home? No, this is what they do. When they heard him say this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, led him to the cliff on the hill so that they might hurl him off the cliff. Who do you think you are, buddy? They're saying. You come out of the wilderness feeling like you're somebody special and you're going to come tell us that in your presence the Holy Scripture is being revealed. Who do you think you are? So from his very first day in ministry, his very inaugural sermon, his first sermon, he's rejected by his town folk. They want to throw him off the cliff. So Jesus is rejected from day one. He's rejected in this village that he wants to come to today. He finally gets to Jerusalem, and what happens when he gets to Jerusalem? His own people hand him over to the Romans for execution. Jesus knows what it means to be rejected. And I believe part of what this scripture is telling us is we have to be able to accept rejection with grace. The disciples want retribution. Jesus says, no, that's not what we do. We're going on down the road to another village. Another lesson we could get from this scripture would be that we have to have single-minded determination to reach our goal. What do we read here? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Nothing was going to distract him from realizing God's claim on his life. And as he's making his way, three people come up to him. The first one says, Lord, Lord, I want to follow you. Jesus says, really? The son of foxes have dens, birds of the air have nests. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. If you follow me, you may not even have any place to sleep. So make sure you really want to come. The second guy says, Lord, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bury my father. Well, that man's father would be alive because in Jewish custom of that day, the moment somebody was dead, they were buried for cleanliness law. What this man really was saying was, my dad's getting old. He's aging. Let me go and take care of him until he dies, and then I'll come. And Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own. Come now, not later, not when all of your family obligations are met. Come now. Third guy comes up and he says, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go home and say farewell to my people at home. That seems like a reasonable request. But Jesus is just as hard on him, isn't he? Jesus says no one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Come now. We're going forward. 
Don't look back. What this scripture is about, unmistakably, is that making a discipleship decision means that you are becoming fully committed. Not volunteers, not part-time employees, fully committed. Alcoholics Anonymous, in their big book, put it like this. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We ask God's care with complete abandon. We stood at the turning point. Half measures availed us nothing. We ask and surrendered ourselves to God with complete abandon. What this text is telling us is that making a discipleship decision is not a career choice. It's not becoming a nicer person. Making a discipleship decision is saying, I'm becoming a totally new person. I'm assuming a new identity. I have reached the turning point. I am giving myself to God with complete abandon. Most of us, like the three who came to Jesus saying, I'll follow you, Lord, but most of us think we want to make a discipleship decision. But we want to stick our toe in the water first. Because we don't want to make promises we can't keep. I'm reminded when I was a young man considering ministry, my mentor and my pastor, Carver McGriff, I went to St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Indianapolis, and Carver McGriff was the pastor. And Carver started talking with me around 1977 or 78, saying, you know, George, you really should consider going to theological seminary and becoming ordained in the United Methodist ministry. And I remember in particular the, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving in 1979, Carver and I were talking in a restaurant on West 86th Street because I was participating in a Thanksgiving service the next day and we were going over parts of that service and Carver started the conversation again in 1979. I remember it clearly. It was 40 plus years ago, but I remember it clearly. I could tell you the restaurant we were on on West 86th Street, except it's no longer there. It's now part of St. Vincent's Hospital. But I had it all in line. I said to Carver, well, Carver, I'd love to do that, but I can't do it. I've got three kids. Four because Sarah wasn't born yet, but at the time I had three. I said, Carver, I've got three kids. I've got a lucrative and secure profession. I've got commitments, man. I've got a mortgage. I've got financial obligations. I can't just up and quit. i got people who rely on me. And then... I had the finale. I thought it sealed the deal. I said, Carver, I can't quit work, and a Master of Divinity is 90 hours. And that's three years full time, and I couldn't possibly do that. I'd have to go part time. I'd have to do six hours a semester. It would take me six years to finish this. And in six years, I'll be 37 years old before I can even qualify for provisional ordination. And I'd be 39 years old before I could be ordained. 
Carver sat with great patience, as was his custom. And then he looked at me and he said words I've never forgotten. I can't forget the expression on his face, or the tone of his voice. This is a guy who's still alive. He landed, he was one of those who landed on June 6, 1944 on the beaches of Normandy. He wrote a book later, Making Sense of Normandy. He knows what pressure is about. And he says to me, he unmasks my arguments for just what they were. I didn't want to leave a familiar, comfortable, predictable life and start a new life. I didn't want to do it. So Carver said to me two things I'll never forget. He said, George, how old are you going to be in six years whether or not you go to seminary? And secondly, he said, I was 37 when I was ordained a provisional elder, and I was 39 when I was ordained an elder. Just like you, pal. What Carver was saying to me was, fish or cut bait, pal. Don't say I want to follow, but... Now, I hasten to say, and hear me on this, not all disciples are going to go to theological seminary and become ordained pastors. Most disciples, most of you are architects or your accountants or your business people or your police officers or your nurses or your teachers, or your farmers. You're not ordained pastors. The disciples didn't go to theological seminary, did they? The original 12. And in, in some ways, Carver regretted that I was going into ordained ministry. In some ways, he said, George, you know your witness... Your witness as a lay person, as a secular person, is more salient in many ways than it will be when you're an ordained pastor because when you become an ordained pastor, people are going to say, well, of course he's saying that stuff. He wants us to come to his church. But as a secular person, if you're making that witness, it's powerful. So remember, your voice is powerful. Well, we're talking about pivotal moments here. Jesus, this is the pivotal moment in Luke's gospel. He turned his face to go to Jerusalem to meet his destiny. Well, this is a pivotal moment for this congregation, isn't it? I think as you prepare to receive a new pastor, we'd be wise to revisit the commitment that you made to the church and remember the vows you made to the church when you joined. Because when you joined the church in the United Methodist Church, you stood before God and the congregation and you made sacred vows that you would share your whole life with Christ and the church. Almost like marriage vows. You promised to support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness. Well, the first two of those, you say, well, I can do that, my prayers and my presence. Presence like presence in the congregation, not presence like money. I can do those first two. I can support the church with my prayers, and I can support the church by being present in the pews. I can do those two. Now, the next two, I'm not so sure. My gifts and my service, money and time, I'm not so sure about that. I've, I don't have enough of either one of those to share, but I'll give what I can. And then the final one, witness. We'll support the church with our witness. Oh, wait a minute, that's hard. That's really hard to do. 
It's okay to witness to people who are already here. We can witness to like-minded believers. But you expect us to go out in the, in the streets and witness? Go out in our places of work? Go out in our neighborhoods? Go to people who don't even go to church and bear witness to Jesus Christ? You want us to do that? No, that's why we have a preacher. That's why we have a preacher. The preacher's the witness. But this text today is saying, Jesus is saying, I don't want any part-time workers. I don't want any part-time workers. I'm reminded in Revelation, where in Revelation chapter 3, the revelator says, your lukewarm witness causes God to vomit. The word vomit's not used, but that's, that's the meaning. Jesus, in this scripture, is telling the three would-be people, I don't need part-time work. I need somebody who is fully invested. Somebody who is willing to come to work full-time for me. Otherwise, leave the dead to bury their own. If you want to look back and go back home and say goodbye to everybody, you're not fit because anyone who looks back is unfit for the kingdom. These are harsh words, aren't they? These are expectant words. And they're directed to us. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ today maybe more than any time in my lifetime, is in dire need of committed witnesses. I believe people are in a search for the sacred. I believe that our leisure and our affluence, and I don't care what your level affluence is. Every person in this room has leisure. We have more leisure and more affluence than we need. We have more in this world than we need. And the fact that it doesn't satisfy us, that still leaves us longing, tells us deep in our soul that we need to look to the eternal and not the temporal. I believe people are hungry to associate with a church that's going to make a lasting difference in the world. And it's going to be a vital witness in the world. People are hungry for that. So as you prepare to receive a new pastor and as that pastor assembles a team the best gift you can give him is your full commitment. Your full commitment. Not the yes buts. The important thing is where we're headed. Not where we are this morning. Remember, Jesus never gave up on those people who came up and said, we want to follow you, Lord. We're going to follow you. We promise we'll follow you, except we've got other things to do for a while. Jesus didn't give up on those people, did he? Even though they vacillated, Jesus didn't give up on them. He continued to love them. And at his death, the Holy Spirit filled those people, some of those people, with courage and power to bear witness and those people 
put themselves in harm's way. And they changed the world. And those people are what the church needs today. Those people can be you people. Amen.
we have our benediction, um, I've asked Jim Ferris to come up and join me so that we can thank and send Pastor George on his way from us with prayer and thanks. <laughs> it is an awkward time to say goodbye. It is an awkward time to say goodbye. I just, am I on? Uh, I just want to speak for the whole congregation, and we appreciate you being here during this time, and i uh, just like to share a short prayer now okay. as we send George off into the world. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we pause at this time to give you thanks for sending us just what we needed. We thank you for the ministry of Pastor George among us. We thank you for the ways he has enriched this congregation, shared his gifts, for walking with us during this time of transition and so many unknowns. We lift up him and Joyce as they go where you lead him next. Give you all the glory and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope where God leads me next for a little while is the armchair, but yeah, this has been this has been much fun, and it's been it's been good for me too. So thank you so much. I will send us forth with these words. I, I will say that November, when Mitch talked to me about this, he talked to me about it. Uh, I think it was the Sunday I was here to baptize the Hendrix child in early November, when Mitch. Talk to me about it, as my letter to you indicated. When Mitt said, "I'm going to need you for a while," I said, "How long?" He said, "Well, possibly till June 30th." I said, "I thought, well, that's a long time, but okay." Well, you know what? June 30th got here quick, didn't it? Yeah, it got here really quick. Seven months later, so, and it's been an unusual seven months, but we've we've navigated it together. I will send us forth with these words from the letter of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. As we close today, um, we're going to do Pastor George's favorite hymn. At one of his first Sundays here, he asked me, what was that hymn that you guys played so wild? So we're going to do a little wild version of Amazing Grace, and you're welcome to stay and sing or be dismissed as you would like.
God bless. Have a good week.